I hate participation trophies. To add context, let me share a story. I was 25, I've been a manager for a little while, and my team was doing a great job. My boss came and asked me if I'd like to attend my very first sales pitch meeting for a new potential client. I'm super excited. I prepare all week. I put on my best suit. I mean, I was looking good, man. Cuff links, $75 tie, the whole show. I greeted those potential clients with exuberant confidence. The meeting goes pretty darn good. I answer the questions that get thrown my way with precision. After the meeting, I'm still pretty pumped at the whole thing. Then the sales manager calls me into his office. Brent, I appreciated how prepared you were and how skillfully you answered their questions. But why didn't you have a notebook with you? Pardon, I say. He says, you didn't have a way to take notes. Don't you realize the kind of message that sends to a person? What if they had said something meaningful? If you're going to attend an important meeting like that in the future, you have to have a way to take notes. Don't come unprepared to a meeting like that the next time. I was flabbergasted. Here I was thinking I had performed exceptionally and I was going to get praise. And this guy's giving me shit. But I quickly realized he had a point. Why didn't I bring a notebook? There were a few things said during the meeting I wish I had written down. I thanked him for the feedback and I slunk back to my cubicle. Now that happened to me 25 years ago and it was one of the best lessons I ever learned. And while yes, I now always have a notebook on me, it taught me something much more important the value of receiving meaningful feedback. Feedback that directly addresses behaviors. You see, he was direct, but he didn't attack me as a person. He just pointed out a behavior that would help me in the future. He identified a mistake I wasn't aware of because you don't know what you don't know. Reflecting on this story reminds me of exactly why I hate participation trophies. For anyone who may not be familiar with participation trophies, I'm talking about where in certain sports or activities, teams and the players on the teams receive a trophy or a medal or a certificate simply for participating, regardless of performance. Now, when I think of participation trophies, I actually see them as a metaphor for how we've built up a culture to protect people from feeling like they've failed. Under the guise of building up self-esteem, we shy away from the truth, afraid to directly address performance issues or even inappropriate behaviors because we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Data explored by social psychologist and author Jonathan Haidt supports a growing portion of the population that's been shielded from adversity, guarded against criticism, and now when faced with failure, they find it hard to persevere. I believe the root cause of this is a failure of leadership. See, this leadership failure, well, it's been decades in the making. Despite its best intentions, since 1969, following the publication of The Psychology of Self-Esteem, North American education started to see a shift. Parents and teachers aiming to shield their young children from low self-esteem heavily relied on positive affirmations and unconditional praise. Participation trophies in sports meant to bolster self-confidence, which were intended to recognize effort over results, were part of this trend. However, it backfired. It led to overparenting, where even older children continue to be overprotected and constantly praised without method, without any merit, including handing out trophies that were unlinked to achievements or even any specific effort. By the 2000s, this approach perpetuated with the next generation. The original participation trophy kids, people in my generation, well, we were now giving our children unearned praise instead of recognizing specific efforts 
and we started solving problems for our kids that they otherwise could figure out on their own. Enter social media and the impact is intensified further. See, social media spins the requirement for external validation into hyperdrive. Getting those thumbs ups, those likes, it becomes a drive. Always posting, seeking validation, seeking praise without effort, all while intensifying sensitivity to criticism. The very first American psychologist pointed something out to us over a hundred years ago when William James told us the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. Now this dangerous cocktail of one part craving for appreciation, one part participation trophy culture, and one part social media has contributed to increasing our fragile popula population. We hear stories from schools every day of parents stepping in to solve problems that kids would have normally been able to solve for themselves. And the problems have started to spill into the global workplace. Parents creating and submitting resumes for their adult kids. Parents calling employers when their adult children are having difficulties at work. 50% of employers have reported getting calls from the parents of adults. While there is an increasing desire to improve employee engagement in workplaces, many of the current strategies rely on dishing out constant false praise in the form of pizza parties or generic team rewards, while managers and supervisors are increasingly afraid to call out poor performance, leading to indirect or no real feedback. A mentor of mine, Canadian psychologist and leadership trainer, Dr. Harvey Silver, many years ago imparted a sil simple silver bullet of, wis of wisdom that has forever stuck with me. Problem behavior ignored is problem behavior encouraged. Now in my career, I've had the privilege to work directly with tens of thousands of people. I've had the opportunity to see firsthand the impacts of both good and bad leadership. Leadership that inspires and informs people to enable growth, improvement, and increases in happiness. And leadership that doesn't. Largely by skipping feedback and doling out the wrong kinds of praise. It turns out there is actually a good way to give praise. When delivered correctly, praise can uniquely fulfill our craving to be appreciated while also encouraging behaviors that will help us grow and improve. In the early 1990s, Dr. Carol Dweck's research at Stanford University in the United States revealed how different types of praise affect children's mindsets. They gave a large group of kids an IQ test, and then they praised one group for their intelligence and another group for their effort. Now, when offered a choice of tasks afterward, most of the kids praised for their intelligence, they chose easier tasks. While those praised for effort, well, they actually chose harder ones. At the end, they gave all the kids a similar IQ test to the first. The intelligence praised group's performance, it dropped. Whereas the kids praised for their effort, their performance improved significantly. This study highlights the difference between a fixed mindset where we see our abilities as unchangeable and a growth mindset where we focus on effort and improvement. Praising qualities attached to a person's identity, it can lead to a fixed mindset, making us risk adverse. In contrast, praising effort and persistence fosters a growth mindset, encouraging us to embrace challenges and improve. See, I coached youth hockey and baseball for about 10 years. Of course, I ensured I did not hand out participation trophies that weren't attached to the recognition of some specific accomplishment or effort. But I also did my best not to praise labels attached to my players' qualities. I didn't say things like, Josh, you're such an amazing hockey player. 
if I had, I would have been setting kids on a path of a fixed mindset, incentivizing them to avoid risk and avoid failing. Instead, I gave praise based on their effort, their effort on their on the ice, their behaviors, their persistence. Josh, you really skated hard out there, especially when you were in a race for the puck. As a result, they started to believe in their capacity to improve, developing a growth mindset. Neuroscience, not just psychology, further supports the tenets of growth mindset. Research has shown that our brain changes. It creates new neural pathways, even grows in size when we exhibit effort and overcome challenges. The brain itself can change, can improve. It's through taking on new challenges, a willingness to accept failure, and learning from our failures that greatness is achieved. But sometimes we simply don't know what we don't know, which is why as leaders, we should take on the responsibility to help people understand why they didn't perform well. We should be analytical about the errors, but not sugarcoat them. As with giving praise that needs to describe the behaviors and efforts, we need to give feedback about what led to the errors. We need to describe the behaviors, but make sure we don't criticize the person. This guidance or coaching is fundamental to how we support the growth of those we lead. I suggest that we use three P's of coaching. One, coaching that we prepare well for. Prepared by understanding their unique story, their goals. Prepared with a knowledgeable understanding of how we can help best help them improve prepared through an evaluation and understanding of what behaviors, what specific behaviors they should continue, stop, and start doing. Two, coaching that we present well. Presented with presence. Presented with not just our words, but our voice, the way we speak. Our eyes, making good eye contact. Our heart, yes, we should care when we're coaching. Our body language, or use our hands. But also our ears, which are always going to be ready to listen. Oh, and maybe we should have a good notebook too. But presenting while being present for them. And three, we need to deliver coaching that is given with the intent of following up after the coaching to help correct them if they fail. But most importantly... The true cornerstone of effective coaching, following up with rapt attention to catch them doing it right so we can give them praise. The right kind of praise. Not praise for their attributes or qualities about their identity, but praise for their behaviors and effort. I've coached thousands of leaders in my career. And without a doubt... Those who embrace coaching others with a growth mindset and follow up on the coaching they provide with effective praise not only help their team's performance improve more, they reinforce a growth mindset in themselves. When it comes to providing the praise itself, I recommend acting like a gardener who wants his plants to grow. If you want your plant to thrive, you're going to need to plant it in a precise location to ensure the optimal temperature and access to sunlight. But you'll need to give it personal attention, the right mix of water and nutrients for that particular plant's growth. And of course, it needs to be attended to promptly. If we delay too long, our plant will wither away. To give precise praise to people, we need to specify exactly what behaviors and effort they're receiving praise for. The world isn't suffering from a lack of praise. It's that we're bombarded with the wrong kinds of praise or empty praise like 
Thanks for being you. You're a rock star. You're so amazing. It's like white noise, or actually even bad noise. For praise to make the kind of change we need to make in the world, we need to ensure our praise recognizes exactly what behavior and effort we want to inspire more of. Not praise for labels attached to our identity, and definitely not praise that was unearned. Precise praise for behaviors, effort, persistence. Now to give personal praise, we need to align the praise with their stories, with their goals, with the way they like to receive praise. And what's in it for them in order to make the praise meaningful? In his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie stressed, if out of this book you get just one thing, it is to always think in terms of the other person's point of view, to see things from their angle. By personalizing praise and un demonstrating that we understand them, we will build and strengthen our relationships. Remember the platinum rule. Treat others the way they wish to be treated. Lastly, when praise is given promptly, it's more relevant. It serves absolutely no purpose to hold back praise waiting for that optimal, precise moment. When you see it, say it. We can lead better by treating people like someone who can choose to improve. Choosing a growth mindset, telling them you're confident that they can handle criticism and that you're confident they can improve. It will make the praise more valuable. We have the power within us to lead society in a more positive direction. We have it in our ability to turn the tide by helping people build the strength to overcome challenges and be receptive to hearing harder truths to help them and us both grow and improve. Please lead with me. Lead with me to inspire and inform and start giving praise the way it should be. Oh, and the next time I walked into a meeting with Rob, the sales manager from many moons ago, he stopped me and said, I really like your new notebook, Brent. I know you'll take great notes.